Most people think Arkansas is full of backwoods hillbillies who make moonshine and kiss on their cousins. If you visit Arkansas, you'll find that's no longer the case and see why they call it the natural state. Driving through the Ozarks, you'll see some of the most amazing views, lakes, and landmarks. In the heart of the Ozarks lies the town of Eureka Springs. In this quaint tourist town, you'll find all walks of life. Shops line the historic district with art galleries, restaurants, hotels, and pubs. Every year, thousands flock to this town to experience the sights and sounds. One of the town's biggest attractions, however, rests off the beaten path. The 1886 Crescent Hotel sits on the highest point and overlooks the hills and valleys of the Ozarks. As ornate as the hotel is, some people come for more than just a trip back in time. Some people come for the ghosts. Known as one of America's most haunted hotels, the Crescent Hotel has seen its share of tragedies, and they all stem back to the time of its construction. Uh, my name is Keith Scales, and I manage the tours here, including the ghost tours. And I'm going into my fourth year, I think, here, working for the Crescent and the Basin Park Hotels. Eureka Springs sprang up overnight. It was uh, as a result of a rediscovery of an ancient Indian healing spring that had been known about in legends actually all over the country but had been lost when the Osage tribe was moved out of this area. Well some years after that removal uh, in 1879 a whole peop a lot of people poured in here uh, to take advantage of the healing waters but uh, to give you the size of the population explosion 1879, there was nobody here. 1880, there was 15,000 people here. So I think when this spring got rediscovered, that the world went, the world went around like wildfire, and people just came here looking for a, a way to get healed for anything. And apparently they did. We have hundreds of testimonials from people who did get healed, however you choose to explain that. Um, but it was uh, an impromptu town. It wasn't planned, ever planned. And there's no level areas around here. It's like a valley, a steep valley with 45 degree sides. And that's where everybody came and threw up shacks and lived in. Well, uh, they, they sort of managed to keep that place going for a, a couple of years, but they couldn't keep up with the old number of people who were coming in, 100, 200 a day. So um, eventually they were kind of rescued by a man named Powell Clayton and uh, he had a vision of this place as a upscale health resort. So he set to work, he organized the town, uh, got some sanitation going for the first time, and he brought in a railroad, and that brought in a whole other uh, a clientele, friends of his, people with money, and to accommodate those people, he built the Crescent Hotel on a mountaintop uh, with three foot thick walls, and uh, that place was populated as his own private uh, getaway for his friends in the railroad business and in politics. 
in uh, around the turn of the century, things change. People stop coming to the waters for one reason or another. And the Crescent Hotel changed and became a conservatory for young ladies, became a girls' school. The Crescent College and Conservatory for Young Women opened its doors in 1908 to 1924, and then again in 1930 to 1934, but it wasn't without tragedy. When it was a girls' school, there was a death. One of the young ladies apparently went over the balcony and uh, plummeted down to the gardens and lost her life there. And after she died, they examined her and discovered that she was with child. Uh, this was a big scandal because the women in the college were not even allowed to correspond with local guys. Uh, they were very heavily chaperoned. Um, but somehow she managed to get herself pregnant. And uh, ever since then, we know that the accident happened at 10.30 at night. And ever since then, well, at 10.30 at night on occasion, um, people will see what looks like a ball of mist coming down from the balcony with a human figure inside it and sometimes they see a guy turning away from where it fell to uh, and we call her the girl in the mist. Then in uh, 37 Norman Baker arrived and he was known all over the country for broadcasting uh, and announcing that he had a cure for cancer. So he, oh, he bought the Crescent Hotel for a song, $40,000 for the hotel and the two parks around it. And he converted it into what he called a cancer curable hospital. Set out a third of a million brochures all over the country. And people poured into this place. He, he actually had two hospitals going at that time and he closed those down and brought all the people here. So he filled the hotel up immediately. He also decorated it in a very, very strange way. Sort of, uh, it had been in a very tasteful hotel and he decorated the whole thing up like a carnival. He said sick people need cheerful places to live in. So he, he did decorate it up in all these you know, strange weird colors and, and designs. Um, well he was here for a couple of years uh, with the place full and, and getting into a more and more of an adversarial relationship with the rest of the community and eventually he was busted because he had no medical degree. Unfortunately, nobody got, got cured because the, his cure was just phony. He was a total scam. He was not a doctor. And he never called himself a doctor either. Um, and then he got busted for mail fraud and uh, he got sent to Leavenworth for a few years. When he came out, uh, he tried to get his scams going again, didn't work, and eventually he died in 1958 of uh, cancer of the liver. From, it was empty through World War II, and then at the end of World War II, uh, some people came to Eureka Springs with major connections in Chicago. And for the next 10 years, the Chicago folks ran both uh, hotels, the Crescent Hotel and the Basin Park, and turned Eureka Springs into uh, Little Chicago for a while. There was a lot of gambling, a lot of illegal drinking going on here. Um, an example of how far it had gone in the direction of Chicago was the cab company here at the time. It's called the Four Deuces, which is the name of Al Capone's uh, private nightclub in Cicero, uh, Chicago. That went on until 55 when there was another major bust and then built those guys out of here. And uh, the hotel has been run again as a hotel, um, but it was kind of on its, it was um, not doing too well. In fact, the place was kind of a shambles in the late 90s, but then Marty and Elise Rennick arrived. They were preservationists and they had some money, so they bought the Crescent Hotel and also the Basin Park Hotel downtown. And they restored them to the way they used to be uh, when they were first opened. Uh, Marty said, in, in five years, I want this hotel to look like it did when it was first built. And now it does, it looks like it did back in 1886. It made it look nice again. And uh, it's, it's, uh, now there's this wonderful hotel sitting in this gorgeous spot in uh, the highest point in the Ozarks um, where there is no reason to have a town at all apart from that magic healing spring. That is, uh, it, people don't come here for the waters anymore, now they come for recreation. But um, one of the reasons they come here is for the present hotel. Uh... 
it's been said that uh, that every place in the hotel is active. Every room, there's something. There's been reports from every part of the hotel, and we and they still keep coming in. On the ghost tours, they, we only tell a few stories, and um, otherwise we can keep them here all night. And the stories that we tell are the stories that have been handed down over the generations. There are hundreds and hundreds of reports. We get letters and we have a website where people will, we invite people to send in their experiences. And they come in on a daily basis, two or three at a time. My name is Catherine Madison. I am a historical ghost tour guide at the Crescent Hotels, 1886. I have been telling stories. I'm also a storyteller here. And I've been doing this for about three and a half years. It is amazing. I love the history and the paranormal. I think my favorite part of the history of the hotel is that the history of the hotel and the history of Eureka Springs and the area is all connected to each other. It's just amazing. Uh, the earliest ghost in the building that we have uh, comes from a time when it was under construction. The building was under construction. It was just a shell at the time. So we're thinking it must have been around 1885. And uh, there was apparently a young man who was one of two families of Irish stonemasons that had been brought down from St. Louis to build it. And the uh, story is that he was quite a ladies' man. He was about 17, 18 years old, good looking young guy, long uh, brown hair, big eyes. And uh, he was working away on top of the building, saw a beautiful girl walking down below, trying to get her attention. And, waved and sort of jumping up and down and uh, calling out to her and unfortunately he overbalanced and it came tumbling all the way down the middle of the building and he landed on a beam and lost his life. That beam is now part of the floor of room 218 except that it seems like he's still here and he still likes the ladies. When guys stay in that room we don't get a lot of activity. When women are alone in that room all kind of stuff happens. Um, we believe that Norman Baker's head nurse, Theodora, is still here. She's been seen uh, outside her room fumbling in her purse for her keys and um, has been asked, you know, can we help you? And she always says, no, thanks, I'm just looking for my keys. And people go away to come back and she's not there anymore and is never seen again. I really connect with Miss Theodora because she's a no-nonsense woman. She's also known as our residential neatnik. She wants things prim, proper, neat, and tidy. And uh, she doesn't like rudeness from people. I talked to the mediums who read this building when it was first opened up by the Renix. Uh, and they, they had uh, two guys, Ken Fugate and Carol Heath, who you can see on the taps, episode 13. Um, they came in here to investigate the building and. They said that they communicated with Theodora, and uh, I don't say this on all the tours, but this is something that they said to me, and I'll say it to you word for word. So they think that Theodora has a function here, and her task is to help uh, people to uh, move on. Room 3500 has produced some very strange photography. Um, and there's a on that hallway, of which 3500 is at the end of, um, people who are sleeping on there report waking up around 3, 3.30 in the morning, which is when most of the activity gets reported, and a glimpsing of a lady in an old-fashioned nurse's uniform pushing a gurney along the hall. And the, what wakes them up is a squeaking wheel from the gurney. Before we started our hunt for the paranormal, we had the opportunity to tag along with one of the ghost tours. Before we start, I just have to tell you that some of these stories are going to be a little bit sad and sensitive because we're talking about the death of some of our spirits, and this is one of them. Because we had a little three-year-old girl die here. Now what we know about her is that her mama was one of Norman Baker's nurses. Now at the time that this was the Cancer Curable Baker Hospital, that nobody was cured in, by the way. Very sad, true story about that time. But the whole fourth floor, this whole area right here, when Norman Baker had this place, the whole fourth floor was the nurses' quarters. Now why this little chair was right here, 
playing with her toys, completely unattended. We'll never know why, but she was. If you will please look at our original banister that's almost 129 years old. It's been here from the very beginning. You can see how easy it could be for a tiny little thing to either slip right on through or go right on over. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. She landed at the very bottom down here where she lost her life. The tour was informative and entertaining. The stories of the hotel's past had guests on edge, as we quickly found out. Give me a few minutes, I'll meet you down there. So the kids, they go down. <laughs> oh my god, really? <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and if you would, make that light flash once for yes and twice for no. Do you understand? Is this you, Michael? Michael, are you going to be nice to us tonight? Is there anyone here with us by the name of Michael? Right now, John and Kim have gone to 218, where uh, a couple of girls have let them in to do an EV EVP session. I'm going to go join them right now. If Michael's with us right now, you think you can move something in that bathroom? Like the curtain or something? Turn the sink on. Flush the toilet. Flip the lid. Close the door. Can you swing that door shut? guys in here but we're not infringing on your turf I think we gotta leave the girls in here all by themselves yeah can you can stay in here with them <laughs> just for a few minutes and see what happens because supposedly he's more active when it's just females in here you guys good with that if you don't want to, you can step out with them, but I am going to stay in here if that's fine. We decided to leave the three women in room 218 by themselves to interact with Michael. Nothing happened, so we decided to focus on them more. Let's try moving this chair to the center of the room and see if they stay solid like that. What? He keeps jumping up and down the cage he neither does. Yeah. When it's set on a solid three or a solid two, but it keeps going to orange and red. Yeah. Are there any people that passed away here when this was a hospital? Are you with us tonight? Can you make a noise? You know, like bang on something or say something? It's just going crazy. 
Thank you. Now we're up to yellow on the other K2 meter. Yeah. Oop, yeah, drop back down there. Do you know that you're dead? One for yes, two for no. I think I want to do an EVP session over in the uh, here in the freezer. I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna grab that recorder. Oh, I got one on here. Uh, Maddie shut the door behind me. We're shutting the freezer door behind Dave. Do you want us to be silent in here? Yes, we will. Okay. I feel you're So what I'm doing right now is I'm inside this freezer. I've got the K2 meter down here on the floor and I've got the uh, uh, digital recorder rolling. So hopefully I'm gonna try to deal with some questions. This is a, a secured room away from any kind of electrical outlets and away from any kind of lines. And if we can get this K2 to light up, we'll know that something paranormal possibly is uh, interacting. Um, so here we go. Hello? If there's anybody in here? My name is David. I'm stuck in this box just like you. K2 hit right now. Is that you trying to light that up? Feel free to light that up. It's okay. If you were sick, please try to keep lighting that up. Try to use as much strength as you've got. If you can see this at home, I'm gonna turn off the night shot and let's see if we can see this. Keep trying to light that up, please. Did you have cancer? If you had cancer, light that up. Please. Nice. Okay. Um, was it cancer? Okay, step away. Step away. It's just going haywire now. I don't know why this is going off. It's going even higher now. Can you get that all the way up to red? That was close. You're doing really good. What's your name? Again, for the record, I don't know what's causing this K2 to light up. It's become too steady to actually really fall into the paranormal realm. There's got to be something naturally uh, man-made that's creating this EMF field. As I've picked this up, it's really become solid. 
No, I'm really thinking that with all of the laundry stuff going off over here, it's making me zapped up. Could be. It could be some of the refrigerator equipment upstairs. Because yeah. above this kitchen is the kitchen. We went to the dining room to continue our investigation. After a little over an hour, we decided to wrap up and call it a night. Because we were here at the beginning of tourist season, we weren't able to investigate without running into some of the guests or employees. Although we didn't capture anything paranormal that night, it was easy for us to see why the Crescent Hotel has a haunting history. research uh, particularly into Norman Baker, a notorious faux doctor who pretended he could cure cancer when he actually couldn't. And I did, uh, that guy's stories were getting completely out of hand there for a while. They were getting magnified on the internet and the stories were just, uh, he turned into Dr. Frankenstein cutting bodies up and exchanging body parts from one person to another and all these rumors were going around. So, and there was supposed to have been like hundreds of missing bodies. And so it just didn't seem very plausible to me. So I asked the hotel if I could explore that. And they sent me up to where he was from and I got every piece of literature and book and newspaper account I could about the guy. And I found out a lot about him. Uh, now I know probably as much about that particular individual as anybody does, because I, I can tell you pretty much what he was every month of his life. And I do a one-man show. I used to be an actor and I performed a one-man show about Norman Baker, so I kind of tried to get inside his head and get from there, uh, learn who he really was. So uh, I think I've learned that. I think I've straightened that history out for the hotel. Um, and I've also discovered a lot of really interesting people who were here apart from Baker. He sort of overshadowed everybody else and this was just the hotel where this horrible doctor lived and worked. Um, but now, for example, there's a lady called Mary Breckenridge, who uh, was here. She was a teacher during the time it was a girls' school. And she had a little boy who died here. And the little boy has been seen by lots of people bouncing his ball up and down a hallway. Uh, and after the little boy died, she got divorced from her husband. She went to France and she studied uh, midwifery in England. This was in 1918 that she, and uh, at that time there were no classes for midwifery for, for women in America. So she uh, went over there and she came back with about 20 midwives and she started something called a Frontier Nursing Service in Kentucky, where these ladies would ride around the hills on muleback and seeing all the women who are out there in the in little shacks out in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And she would, uh, and the midwives would stay with them to help them through the labor and everything. So anyway, uh, the Frontier Nursing Service still exists, and uh, it's estimated that she saved thousands of lives, particularly babies' lives, uh, but also the, the mothers. And now, um, if you want to see a likeness of this lady, she's on the 77 cent stamp, and she lived here. She was married to the principal of the school here for a while. So people like that I've discovered who, uh, who's, who's uh, sort of just got lost to history, but they're really, really neat people who have been here. 